Okay, so I can't find a boom box. Where are you going to find a boom box in the year 2022? So you just got to use a, a Bluetooth speaker. That's what I got. Sorry. <laughs> Hello! Welcome to Alyssa Jean's Reviews. My name is Alyssa, and this, of course, is my review for Star Trek for The Voyage Home, also known as, you know, that one with the whales. So uh, this is part of a series of videos in which I will be reviewing every uh, Star Trek film in the original series, so the first six films. Uh, one month at a time, here in the month of April, we are up to Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. The way this will work is I'll start with a little bit of an overview, my overall thoughts, and then I'm going to go into recap mode and recap the entire film scene by scene. So if you're looking at the runtime of this video and thinking, oh, it's kind of a long video for an Alyssa Jean video, it's because I'm going through the whole movie. Okay, so we'll start uh, before I do my recap with my overall thoughts. And uh, I rewatched this film for the first time in a while and it is still a really great film. It is still a really funny film. I dare say it's the master class in Star Trek comedy. Personally, I am not usually a fan of Star Trek comedy outside of Lower Decks. Lower Decks is, is a different animal. I'm talking about the generally serious shows and films that attempt comedy. I feel like most of the time they fail miserably, and in, uh, particularly Deep Space Nine is terrible at it. <laughs> and pretty much my entire top ten of least favorite Deep Space Nine episodes were bad attempts at comedy. <laughs> um, so... This is the gold standard, in my opinion, that this has never been duplicated. The comic timing is just genius. Uh, the interactions between all of the characters is brilliant. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, Leonard Nimoy did a fantastic job at directing as well. And uh, this also sets the gold standard for time travel Trek stories, as uh, many uh, episodes try to duplicate this film and uh, all have failed. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of uh, the Voyager two-parter Futures and Parts 1 and 2, which per personally I think is mediocre, um, but uh, pales in comparison to the film that it was emulating. And then, of course, right now um, we're damn smack in the middle of Star Trek. I guess dab smack is the, is the appropriate term. Uh, in the middle of Star Trek Picard. Uh, so we're, uh, as of, of this recording, we've watched half of the season and they're attempting to do that. And they even paid homage to that little scene that I was paying homage to at the beginning of this video, um, which I really enjoyed that they did that. But other than that, um, it just is falling into cliches and old tropes and will never duplicate the original. So it is good to watch the original again. Uh, and, um... You know, as far as uh, the complaints of the years about it being too preachy and all of that stuff, to me, I don't view it as preachy. I view it as having an important conversation. It's the same thing uh, with any other environmental issue, uh, hunting animals to extinction, climate change, any of that to me. Uh, it, needs to be t it needs to be said, it needs to be talked about. When Spock says... Uh, hunting a species to extinction is illogical. You're damn right it is, and that needs to be said. And I'm sorry if you get butt hurt over that. Uh, that's a you problem. <laughs> this is something that needed to be out there at the time and still needs to be out there. Uh, and I'm glad Star Trek took it on. And from a Gene Roddenberry future, you know, you've, um, utopia perspective, um, they would look at it exactly like that, and I think that needed to be said, and I applaud them for doing that, and I don't care if people think it's too preachy. I think it was great. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let me now dive into my recap. I'm going to go through scene by scene through the entire film. Okay, I'll start my recap uh, where I've started uh, with every film, and that's with the opening credits. So uh, for Star Trek Three, I had said that I felt that the opening credit sequence had gotten better with each film. I think that streak comes to an end here. I do like how in the beginning they like beam in the title card, like the Star Trek IV thing goes beams in. I think that was kind of cool. But the problem is the music is absolutely forgettable. I just watched the movie a couple hours ago and I don't, I've already forgotten what the, the song is because it's just completely 
not catchy, not memorable at all. Why did they not just stick with the Star Trek 2 one? The da -na 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 -na. Like that's stuck, that gets stuck in my head. This one is completely forgettable. Um, but one thing I did like about the credits is they did the uh, Star Wars uh, episode for A New Hope thing, uh, where, you know, in Star Wars, the, uh, the what you call it, the um, scrolling text uh, finishes up and then a ship, Actually, two ships fly into the space where the scrolling text just was, and they do that here with the credits. Uh, the big probe, uh, alien probe thing, making the whale sounds, flies right into where the credits are, and I kind of like that in sci-fi. I think that's kind of cool when they do that. Um, so uh, we open up um, with the big whale probe, going, making that noise, uh, and then we get uh, uh, the USS Saratoga, and our first female captain shown on Star Trek. Also, uh, I believe the first black captain shown on Star Trek, if I'm not mistaken. I knew we got a black uh, uh, admiral or commodore in the original series. Uh, but I believe this is the first black captain and definitely the first female captain. Definitely the first black female captain. So we get that on the USS Saratoga. And I was realizing uh, in the, a pattern uh, <laughs> of these four films, all four of them have a lesser starship uh, in the setup portion of the film. Not always in the very first scene, uh, but in the setup portion of the film, there is some lesser starship that's not the Enterprise. And uh, in Star Trek two and three, the lesser starship had characters that we know, uh, Chekhov in Star Trek two, and then uh, Savick and David in Star Trek three. Uh, but everyone has had like a lesser, <laughs> a lesser starship in it. Anyways, so then we go to like the Federation Council, and uh, uh, there's these Klingons being completely unreasonable dicks, <laughs> uh, and um, just completely twisting the facts. And then Sarah comes in and basically gives us a quick little summary of what actually happened in Star Trek Three, um, and. Uh, by the way, though, when the Klingons are showing the, uh, you know, the Enterprise exploding, uh, who got the external camera shots of the Enterprise? Uh, is there, was there a camera just kind of floating in space? Like, how do they get that? <laughs> I know. I'm being nitpicky. Star Trek does this all the time. It's not anything new. I just kind of think it's funny. <laughs> um... Uh, meanwhile, on the planet Vulcan, uh, the crew agrees to go to Earth and face the consequences. They all go down the line and say, I, Admiral, I, Admiral, I, Admiral. And uh, they've also got some Vulcans to graffiti the words bounty on the, <laughs> on the, the ship. Um, you know, like mutiny on the bounty. Yeah, I thought that was a little silly, <laughs> but whatever. Um, Spock uh, is uh, taking that little test. I always remember this from when I was a kid. Correct, correct, correct. How do you feel? <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, he's struggling with kind of relearning himself. Uh, he talks to his mom about his feelings and friendships and um, tells her, you know, humans make illogical decisions. Uh, talking about Kirk saving him. And she's like, yes, yes, they do. Um, so we thus we start our uh, Spock journey here, um, the one that he will go through throughout the the um, the film, trying to refine himself and refine his friendships. Um, so then we cut back to the Saratoga and the whale probe. Um, I remember this being really ominous and and scary, and I, I still feel it. But uh, certainly when I first saw it, I definitely felt. Like, having never seen it before, I was, like, a little bit uh, creeped out by this thing, and uh, that's a good thing. Um, and then we see that the Saratoga loses power just by being close to it, so we're starting to get some stakes here for the first time. Um, then we go over to Starfleet Command. We get the introduction of Admiral Cartwright, played by actor uh, Brock Peters, uh, who would reprise the role in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, and then later would return to Star Trek uh, in Star Trek Deep Space Nine as Joseph Sisko, uh, father of Captain Benjamin Sisko. Now, I'm wondering if they have made it canon that Admiral Cartwright is like Joseph Sisko's grandfather, 
and Benjamin Sisko's great grandfather because they could do that because uh, Admiral Cartwright could have had a daughter who married somebody named Sisko and they have a kid together named Joseph Sisko. <laughs> I'm just saying because Star Trek loves to have the same actor played uh, different generations <laughs> in a family like uh, how Fred Spiner has played every Soong in history <laughs> as one example. And then in Star Trek VI, which I'll get to in a couple months, we have uh, Michael Dorn playing Worf's ancestor. So Star Trek loves to do that. So I don't know if they have canonized that yet, but I won't be surprised if they, if they did or if they do in the future. Um, okay, so then we get back to Vulcan. Um, we get a Savic cameo, which uh, personally I think was kind of unnecessary because all she does is uh, repeat the exact same line that Kirk says to Spock, uh, where she says, uh, I just wanted you to know, David, he saved the ship, he saved us all, uh, which is exactly what Kirk said. Spock, you saved the ship, you saved us all. Like, I don't know. Um, I mean, we did need to see, you know, where Savick was going, but I don't know. Uh, anyways, so uh, Spock comes aboard, he's calling him Admiral, uh, Kirk is trying to get him to call him Jim. You remember when you used to call me Jim? He's like, no, it would not be proper. Um, and we're seeing Spock is different. Uh, McCoy uh, doesn't think it's a great idea to have Spock go along with them. Um, and he says he's not exactly working on all thrusters. And honestly, I do think McCoy has a point here because Spock doesn't really need to go with them for any particular reason. He really should probably just stay on Vulcan, but he needs to be in the movie. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why he has to go with them. Uh, but there really isn't a great in-universe reason for him to go with them. So we cut back to the probe. Uh, it continues to be ominous. It's draining all the power of all the ships that come across it. It gets to Earth and it's draining all the power at Starfleet Command. It's causing chaos in the ocean. Uh, meanwhile, we see Kirk and Ahura trying to figure out uh, what's happening. How come there's no uh, starships to escort them? Uh, and then we get a scene with McCoy actually for once trying to be nice to Spock. He's never nice to Spock. He's always a dick to Spock. <laughs> Um, but Spock doesn't uh, know what to do with it. He reject, kind of rejects him, and uh, McCoy goes, Oh, well, you're a damn Vulcan. <laughs> and, um, then we see again, things are getting worse on Earth, um, and uh, then eventually we'll see uh, the President of the Federation sending out a message, do not approach Earth. Probe, the probe is causing, like, really critical damage, uh, vaporizing our oceans, and he ends with saying, avoid planet Earth at all costs uh and then so kirk and spock start listening to uh the uh, sound that the probe is making um and uh spock says that it is illogical that its intentions should be hostile um and then uh spock is the one who suggests that it, it could possibly be trying to communicate with something other than man that it's uh kind of arrogant of us to think that it has to be communicating with man that's very smart i think that's that's uh very perceptive of him uh but then he figures out that uh it's the humpback whales okay so this is the thing that i've complained about with spock in the past in fact i think i referenced this uh in last week's star trek picard episode that this is a thing that spock always did like have this knowledge uh, that is convenient for the plot, but he really should have no business knowing. So how exactly uh, does a Vulcan who was raised on Vulcan know the sound of an extinct creature on Earth that has been extinct for 200 years? Like, how would he know that? I don't know. But you know what? It doesn't bother me, actually. I, I have to point it out. Um, but it doesn't actually bother me here because... Overall, I still love this film, whereas like in something like the episode Spectre of the Gun, which is an episode that I hate, <laughs> where Spock is like, oh, so I have this very convenient knowledge about the OK Corral. Like, that drives me crazy, but since I like the film, it's like, whatever, this is fine. <laughs> but I, have, I do have to point out that how would he know <laughs> what humpback whales sound like? Um, so then uh, when they, they, they come up with their plan, you know, to go back in time, uh, and uh, McCoy complains and says, oh, this is just crazy. Uh, and uh, Kirk gives him the response that that deserves, uh, which is, you got a better idea? 
I'll hear it now. Uh, and they should say that to McCoy every time, because McCoy always does this, and it, especially he did it to Spock whenever Spock was in charge. I, I, I'm thinking particularly of the episode The Gamesters of Triskelion, uh, when uh, Kirk and Uhura and, uh, uh, who was it, Chekhov, were uh, kidnapped, and they, they were trying to find them, and uh, Spock had a great plan to find them, and McCoy was just following him around, harassing him, going, You're an idiot, Spock! You're gonna kill us all! You're doing it all wrong! Uh, and then doesn't apologize when Spock turned out to be 100% correct. Uh, and uh, he doesn't ever offer any alternate suggestions. He just likes to complain. It drives me crazy. It drives me crazy when people do that in real life. Just complain, complain, but can't come up with any alternate suggestions. So Kirk had the perfect response. You have a better idea? I'll hear it now. And that shut McCoy the fuck up because he doesn't have a better idea. Anyway, that annoys me when he does that. <laughs> uh, so... Um, then the, the tension starts to build. We get this exciting scene that always stands out of my memory uh, with Kirk sending that garbled message uh, that Starfleet can't really uh, see uh, and says, We are going to attempt time travel. Uh, and then there's a signal and Admiral Cartwright goes, Get him back! Get him back! And then the windows crash in. I always love that scene. Uh, and we re will revisit that scene. Uh, at the end of this film as well. Uh, so then they do the slingshot around the sun, and uh, then they have this like really strangely trippy scene that looks like somebody's on LSD, or uh, I guess LDS, as Kirk would call it later in the film. This like weird scene with all these, the crew's faces popping up like statues of Greek gods, and they're all saying lines. I didn't like pause it and listen to the lines that they're saying. Uh, and then cut to these weird ass whales, and then some weird dude falling down to the earth. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> so who's tripping? <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand what was happening there. I never really put much thought into it until I did this rewatch. I was like, what is going on here? What are, what are they? Do? What are they going for here? Um, anyways, after all that weird trippy stuff. It's quiet and calm. They realize that they've succeeded. They've gone back in time. Um, they uh, engage the cloaking device, which is a good thing that they happen to be in a Klingon ship because if they were in the Enterprise, they wouldn't be able to do this. Um, so um, this is when uh, uh, Hora says, Sir, I am receiving a whale song. <laughs> How is she receiving whale song? I don't know, but whatever. It's fine. Okay, so this is when Scotty calls Kirk down to engineering and uh, gives him the bad news that the uh, crystals have been uh, drained by the time travel. And he says uh, they got 24 hours before they not only decloak, but they'll just be dead in the water uh, to say nothing about getting home. Um, and Spock comes up with the idea to use nuclear power. Once again, having convenient knowledge he shouldn't have, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> and then... Um, Kirk comes up with a plan to split up into different teams. Um, the comical scene where Spock uses his robe to make a headband <laughs> to, to cover up his ears. Um, uh, then uh, they go and decide to park the ship in uh, Golden Gate Park. Well, I don't know why Golden Gate Park. I guess because there's a lot of room and they wouldn't have to be in the city. Um, and then yeah, you got that scene with the garbage man and the wind blowing. And then the ship appears like, did you see that? No, neither did you, so shut up! And then they, they drive off. Um, so they're, they're there. They're in the 20th century. Uh, they're in the 80s. And uh, then they, they get out of the ship, and uh, uh, Kirk says, Everyone remember where we parked? Which is a very strange thing to say for a 23rd century man. Like, what do they park in the 23rd century? Like, why, why would that be a thing? <laughs> but anyways, being nitpicky. Um, then they go into... Uh, the city, um, and right away we get the line, Double dumbass on you! <laughs> Still hilarious. Still really funny. Uh, it has not lost its humor after all of this time. Um, and uh, they're playing 80s music, because we know we are in the 80s. Um, Kirk will then go and sell McCoy's glasses that he had given him uh, in, I believe that was Star Trek II, and uh, Spock says, weren't those a gift from Dr. McCoy? And he's like, well, they will be again. That's the beauty of them. Try not to overthink the time travel logic. Um, if this was 
Actually, if this was uh, the type 1 time travel logic, which is uh, typically used by uh, Lost, the show, um, where whatever happened, happened, this would create a paradox, like, just like the, the compass uh, in Lost, where it has no beginning or end. Uh, but this track uses type 2 time travel logic in which uh, the past can be changed, so I think that means that there's two pairs of, of the same glasses existing at the same time, which which boggles my mind. Anyways, <laughs> I always have to think about things like this. Uh, Kirk gets $100, uh, splits it all up between all of them, which does not feel like a lot of money to me, even for 1986, but they don't really buy much. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, they, they, I guess, ride the bus, but that's about it. Um, and we get another comical scene uh, with uh, Spock going through all these complex calculations uh, to try to find the whales. And then Kirk sees the ad uh, for George and Gracie uh, and and uh, and tells Spock exactly where they need to go. And Spock's like, how do you know? Simple logic, and which I thought was very funny. Uh, again, the comedy just works in this film. Uh, and then you see them get on the bus and then get right back off the bus <laughs> immediately with Spock saying, what does this mean? Exact change. <laughs> um, and then another great scene where you got uh, McCoy, Scotty, and <laughs> and Sulu trying to figure out, like, how are we going to find uh, some plexiglass? Uh, how in the world are we going to do that? I mean, never mind. They could have just go back to the ship and probably use the computers, but <laughs> whatever. They're walking around and... and uh, uh, they, all of a sudden they turn around there's this huge uh, wall size ad taking up the whole wall for the yellow pages trying to find something <laughs> or I think it was you can't find it try Pacific Bell yellow pages <laughs> so uh, another good scene um, and then of course we have Chekhov going around asking for the nuclear vessels <laughs> again I feel like can't, couldn't the ship's computers help them out? I mean, I know it's a Klingon ship, but doesn't it have, like, Google Maps or something? Like, couldn't they, you know, easily locate where the nuclear base was? But if they did that, then we wouldn't get the funny scenes. Just check off going, hey, excuse me, excuse me, can you tell me where the nuclear vessels are? <laughs> oh, it's just still uh, a great scene. Um, then after that, we cut to... Um, Kirk and Spock on the bus, I guess they figured out how to get exact change, and then we get that scene in which I uh, kind of recreated for you uh, at the beginning of this video, which also Star Trek Picard uh, recreated. Um, so, uh, with the same guy, same actor. It's not an actor, I guess he was a producer on Star Trek um, who played the role and also wrote that song. Uh, and a classic, classic scene when Spock does the uh, Vulcan nerve pinch <laughs> on him. And uh, then th after that, they have this little conversation uh, about colorful metaphors and double dumbass and as and such. <laughs> and uh, um, I guess maybe this could explain why so many people got so bent out of shape in Star Trek Picard season one when that Admiral said pure fucking hubris. Um, because this movie seems to be setting the standard that they don't uh, cuss in the 23rd century. But I think, I'm sorry, but I think that's dumb. <laughs> like, I think um, cussing is a part of human existence. I think when it's done, um, you know, properly and not overdone, not overused, I think cussing adds a lot uh, of emotion and power. Uh, if, if that admiral has just said that's pure hubris, that is not as powerful as saying it's pure fucking hubris. I think, uh, I think it makes a lot more sense that humans would continue to cuss. And this, so this movie seems to be like saying, "Oh, cussing is bad. We don't do it anymore," which I think is silly. So I think that whole thing is dumb. I think Star Trek Picard fixed that mistake. Um, so uh, then they go to the uh, Cetacean, uh, I want to say Cetacean Observations, because that's from a different YouTube video, uh, the Cetacean uh, place, and do the tour, and this is where we meet Gillian, who I had to look up her name on IMDb, because if they say her name in this film, I missed it. I don't really think they say her name very often. 
um, if at all. Um, she's giving him the tour. There's this stupid 80s looking teenager kid going, do whales eat people like in Moby Dick? <laughs> and, and she says, no, no, no. Um, but it has another really bad enemy, the worst enemy that it has. And Kirk says, man. Um, and this is where Spock says the line, to hunt a species to extinction is illogical. And she replies, whoever said humans were logical, uh, which I'm sure Spock totally agrees with. <laughs> um, uh, then we get uh, the scene where they're standing looking at the whales underwater and Kirk looks around and he can't find Spock and then he sees Spock swimming underwater uh, doing a Vulcan man meld, mind meld, uh, and then we get that funny scene with the old lady saying, uh, maybe he's singing to that man! <laughs> and uh, Gilliam's like, what the fuck is this? Um, I don't know, I feel like none of these places have security. I'll talk about that more in just a minute with Scotty and McCoy. Where is the security? Like, anybody can just jump in that water, huh? Okay, whatever. <laughs> um... Anyways, then uh, once he gets out, then he tries to use his colorful metaphors and keeps saying to hell. <laughs> he keeps overusing it. Uh, and Gillian just thinks that uh, they are nuts. Then we get a quick scene with Gillian and uh, the stereotypical asshole supervisor who pretends to be her friend. Um, and he says uh, dumbass shit like, oh, well, they aren't that intelligent anyway. Like, how is this dude even working there if that's what he thinks about the whales? Like, how do you rise to the rank of supervisor if that's what he thinks about the whales? Um, anyway, he's a, he's an asshole. So uh, then we cut over to Aura and Chekhov, who have somehow located the nuclear vessels. They don't really show us how. Uh, maybe they finally figured out that they could just go back to the ship and, <laughs> and use their scanners. Um, and uh, Chekhov calls... Kirk, I thought Kirk said at the beginning, only call if it's an emergency. And Chekhov calls just to say, Admiral, it's the Enterprise. Okay, great, yeah. Or there's been a million ships called the Enterprise. This is not a big deal. <laughs> like, you don't have to call Kirk for that. Like, he said only call in emergencies. Anyway. <laughs> anyways. So, uh, Gillian pulls up in the truck uh, to Kirk and Spock. Um, Kirk tells her that uh, Spock was a big part of the free speech movement in the 60s and did too much LDS. I don't know. I feel like, I don't know how he would know as much as, you know, there's a free speech movement in the 1960s and he would know to call it the 60s. Like, I don't know if that is, how would he know that? Uh, and, and if he knows that much, then I feel like he would know LSD. Like he would, if he, it should be all or nothing. Like he either knows everything or he doesn't know anything. I think more likely he should know, like to say the sixties. Um, anyway, she picks him up on the ride. She's uh, trying to uh, get some information from them. Um, she knows something is up here um, and they're dodging the questions. Um, and then Spock says, Gracie is pregnant. And she slams on the brakes and she's like, what the fuck? How do you know this? Um, and then Kirk redirects her to, oh, you want to get Italian? Do you like Italian? And uh, um, actually, no, he asked her to get dinner. And she says, do you like Italian? Because then they have that scene where he's like, no, yes, no, yes, no. I love Italian and so do you. Yes. <laughs> See, that's what I mean by comic timing. Like the character interactions. Just, just so good. Um, Spock ends up not going out with them, but that's a little bit later. Now we cut over uh, to uh, Scotty and McCoy um, at the pe plexiglass uh, factory, um, and they're uh, posing as Professor Scott. And I'm sorry, but this, they don't have any kind of security measures at all. Like, anybody with a Scottish accent can call them up and say that they're coming to do a tour, and they believe them? Like... <laughs> Like, no security measures. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty then. Um, and then uh, as they are on their way, Scotty says, uh, can my assistant come along? <laughs> and then McCoy is like, yeah, don't bury yourself in the part. <laughs> um, and it made me think that... Um, we really don't get a whole lot of McCoy and Scotty interplay over the years. Like, those two characters don't really play off of each other uh, very often during the original series. 
Uh, so I like this pairing. I think that was very fun. Um, then we see uh, Sulu uh, with the helicopter pilot again. So any random dude can walk in there and just walk up to the helicopter like, <laughs> where is security? <laughs> um, then we get the scene, uh, the, the very famous scene, uh, very memorable scene, where Scotty sits down at the computer and goes, hello, computer. I mean, does he, he, he would know that the computers didn't talk in the, in the 20th century. He should know that, but... Uh, it still makes for a funny scene. And then uh, McCoy takes uh, Scotty aside and is like, are we sure we want to do this? We could contaminate the timeline. And Scotty says, oh, how do we know he didn't invent the thing? Well, here's how you know he didn't invent the thing, Scotty, because you exist in type 2 time travel logic. That's what Star Trek goes by always. That means that uh, when you travel back into the past, Anything you do will change the timeline. That's how it works always, almost always in Star Trek. Um, and it's certainly how it works here. Um, type 1 is that whatever happened, happened. And uh, that would be the type of time travel logic where it might be possible uh, for this person to have always invented uh, this thing that they're giving him. Um, but since that's not your type time travel logic that you use in Star Trek, that's not what happened. You're totally contaminating the timeline and you're changing it. So this dude invented <laughs> that whatever, that plexi, that thin plexiglass thing. Um, but uh, all throughout this movie, they're completely careless <laughs> with, with changing the timeline. Uh, I'll talk about another example later on. Um, the time travel logic is sound, though. Uh, I, uh, a few weeks ago, did a live chat where I was talking about the Ryan Reynolds movie on Netflix called The Adam Project, and how while well, other people enjoyed the film, I had a hard time enjoying it because I was just bogged down with the faulty time travel logic and it drove me crazy because there'd be paradoxes all over the place, paradox, paradox, and here that's not the case. The time travel logic is pretty sound, however, the characters are very, very... Uh, Lucy Goosey <laughs> uh, with protecting the timeline. I mean, they're very careless. Like they they don't give a shit about the timeline. But I guess it worked out for them. So, because the changes that they cause to the timeline apparently don't have any uh, major effects because things seem to be normal when they return to the twenty third century. Um, so. And then they uh, drop Spock off at uh, Golden Gate Park because he decided not to go to have Italian. Um, and then he walks away and gets beamed aboard. Who beamed him aboard? It was, I, had Scotty beat him to the ship? And I don't know. <laughs> I'm being nitpicky. Anyway, uh, so Kirk and Gillian go to dinner. Um, and he tells her that he can take the whale somewhere where they'll never be hunted. Um she doesn't believe him. Also, I noticed that Kirk doesn't like Michelob. He takes a taste off uh, out of his Michelob and it's like, mm, mm, I don't blame him. That shit's garbage. Not very good. And <laughs> anyways, um, she Gillian's like, don't tell me. You're from outer space. Uh, and I love Kirk's response here. No, I, as I told you, I'm from Iowa. I just work in outer space. And she's like, oh, okay, right, all right. Uh, then he just ends up... Uh, blurting out the truth um and she's very sarcastic in response but i think part of her is already starting to believe it because there's just a lot of things that don't really add up here then uh, from kirk and gillian at dinner the film cuts over briefly to ohura and Chekhov. we see that they are on the uh enterprise the nuclear vessel enterprise and are starting to uh, download the energy, nuclear energy or whatever, into their little device. And uh, then we go back to Gillian and Kirk. Uh, she drops them off at Golden Gate Park. Uh, he says, think about my offer for the whales. She still doesn't quite believe him. He gets out and then uh, she hears the beaming sound and turns around and he's gone. Uh, so she's starting to think, uh, something's up here. Um, then we go back to Ahura and Chekhov, and for some reason that was unclear to me, <laughs> they, they can only be beamed out one at a time. Um, and uh, Chekhov gives the thingy to Ahura and says, you go. They weren't thinking this through. I guess they weren't thinking about the Cold War and the fact that Chekhov is Russian, and really the Russian guy should have been the one who left. 
Um, uh, then Chekhov gets uh, taken in and interrogated, and the guy is like, "Okay, take it from the top." See, this is a great, this is a great comedy scene. This is like uh, an Abbott and Costello routine <laughs> where he's like, "Take it from the top." Chekhov's like, "The top of what? Name." my name and the guy's like no my name and he's like i don't know your name <laughs> uh, quit playing games with me no that was a great scene it's just, just just the comedy the comic timing is so good in this film um then uh Chekhov ends up getting out of that room super easily barely an inconvenience i don't know why they left the door open <laughs> but he just uh gets on out but uh he uh, doesn't get away because he ends up slipping and falling from a long, uh, high distance uh, and hurts himself. Um, then uh, we cut back to the ship with uh, Kirk telling Scotty to hurry up. Uh, Scotty probably giving him uh, an overestimate of how long it's going to take. I mean, he admitted that that's what he did. Uh, was that Star Trek Three or Star Yeah, it was Star Trek Three, right? Where Scotty confess that that's what he does and uh, Kirk still doesn't hasn't caught on um then uh Gillian goes back to uh her uh the, the cetacean place and finds out the whales were sent away early when she sees the empty tank she slaps that asshole dude and uh, who deserves it uh then she drives to go find Kirk um then uh, Sulu has the helicopter how did he get it did he steal it I'm not sure and um I don't know, like, couldn't, maybe Sulu should have, like, dropped it off somewhere discreet and then they beam the thing into the ship from there because it's, I mean, it's kind of weird for them to have Scotty come out of the cloaked ship, like, it looks like a dude is standing in, in midair, like, bringing this thing in, uh, into midair, which, of course, Gillian ends up seeing, but anybody could have seen that, I think that was a bad idea, um, so Gillian uh, ends up seeing that she runs up to the the ship. She run, bumps into it, which is invisible, of course, and, and then starts banging on it and starts screaming for Kirk. Um, they beam her into the ship and she screams. So is there a physical sensation when you when you get beamed? Um, I had never really thought about it that much, but uh, if someone who's never experienced it before screams, um, then there must be a physical sensation. I kind of always assume there wasn't, but uh, it makes sense that there would be, and people who do it all the time are just kind of used to it. Um, so uh, she beams in, and for some reason, uh, I don't know, I don't love William Shatner's acting sometimes. He's talking to her like she's a baby, and I just totally think that that's William Shatner's acting. Um, she tells him about what happened to the whales, um and and kirk is like well we can't go anywhere and she's like well what kind of ship is this and he's like a ship who's missing a man uh so they need to get check off and spock says you yeah, uh you know there's not a logical thing to do but it's the human thing to do so you know spock is, is coming along um and uh, then they go to the hospital where they got those scrubs i have no idea but they got them um mccoy contaminates the timeline again by healing this old lady who uh might have died Otherwise, and maybe she was supposed to die then. I mean, what if she goes and does something after that and contaminates the timeline? They don't care about the timeline at all. They're so careless. Also, does he just carry around magic pills in his pocket? Like, how does he have these pills? <laughs> Anyways, I know, I'm being very nitpicky. I still love this film overall, but I, it's fun also to just kind of nitpick as well. Um, so then uh, they... Bust into the room where Chekhov is. McCoy is arguing with the doctors. And it's like, my God, man. And McCoy, all this time, is just making all these comments about, oh, this is the Dark Ages. <laughs> and all that. That kind of thing. Uh, Kirk puts uh, the um, the doctors all into this little room so McCoy can continue to complain about their medievalism as he works on Chekhov. McCoy puts the little thingy on Chekhov's heads. Uh, t and Kirk calls him Pavel. Uh, which, is that the first time he's ever called him that? I, that's very, very rare uh, that he would call him by his first name. Uh, and, uh, and we got another uh, comedic scene with uh, uh, Chekhov, with Kirk asking him, what's your name? And he's like, uh, Pavel Chekhov, what's your rank? Admiral. <laughs> that was really funny. Um, 
And then I think it's the way that Walter Corning delivers that line to Rank Admiral. It's just really good. Anyways, so uh, they beam to uh, just outside of the ship, I guess because they didn't want to beam Gillian onto the ship. Uh, and then Kirk says, Scotty, uh, beam me up, which is the closest he really ever gets to saying to beam me up, Scotty, which is what everyone thinks he said, which he never actually said. But he, he's pretty close here. I think he says, Scotty, beam me up or Scotty, beam me in. Um, so pretty close there. Gillian grabs Kirk uh, so that uh, she can go uh, with them. But uh, why didn't they just beam her back out of the ship? Like Kirk's like, okay, well, you got me. I guess you're going with us to the 23rd century now. Just beam her the fuck out. Like, why is that That's so hard? Again, they're just not thinking at all about containing the timeline. They didn't look up in the computer to see if maybe she has kids after this. I guess they're assuming, well, she's too old for kids. Because if she had kids after this in the original history, they have now erased an entire bloodline. And hopefully nobody in that bloodline does anything important. Uh, at the very least, they get back to the 23rd century and some dude has disappeared from existence because he was the descendant of this lady who is no longer in the 20th century. But I guess it worked out. I guess she never had kids after this. So, uh, But they didn't look it up to see. Like, they're just so careless with the timeline. It's just ridiculous. Um, anyways, so uh, Spock and McCoy have this talk. Uh, where uh, McCoy tells Spock, well, you're just going to have to make your best guess. And Spock's like, yes, yeah, so uh, what is that? I don't know how to do that. Um, then uh, they find the whales. Of course, there is a whale hunting ship right there to make it a little exciting. And I've always loved the scene, though, when the, uh, the whale hunting ship shoots the harpoon and it goes clunk and bounces off the invisible Klingon ship. And then they decloak so that the ship is like, oh my god, turn around, ding, 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 and like furiously turning the steering wheel. Uh, always have really enjoyed that scene. Um, and uh, then uh, Scotty beams up the whales with water. I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know you could like beam up water. Like, how does that work? I don't know, <laughs> but uh, he does it. And uh, he goes, Captain, or uh, Admiral, I guess, Admiral. There be whales here. <laughs> um, and uh, then they fly off. And they seriously should have just beamed Gillian back off. Like, they could, from there, they can beam her anywhere. They can beam her back to San Francisco from Alaska. I mean, that's how it works. Uh, you can beam from great distances. So they could have beamed her anywhere. Uh, but no, they're insistent on risking contamination of the timeline. <laughs> so they take her <laughs> take her with them um and then when spock tells kirk that he's gonna have to make a guess kirk is like spock that's extraordinary <laughs> um and spock's like well, what, what what what's wrong with that and mccoy's like no he's saying that you know he has more faith in your guesses than a lot of people's facts uh which is good um then uh you know, let's see what else they slingshot around the sun again. This time they don't go through the weird acid trippy thing <laughs> with everybody's faces popping up like weird liquidy Greek statue thingies. <laughs> um, also, why didn't Chekhov take off the hospital scrubs? He's wearing it the whole time. Why didn't he just take it off? Like, is he naked underneath there, I guess? I mean, I've assumed he would have something else underneath there. He'd just rip it off. But anyways, <laughs> he's still wearing them. Um, then they get exactly back to the moment with Admiral Cartwright going, get him back, get him back. Um, the ship goes out of control, but manages to get under the Golden Gate Bridge and land in the water. Uh, of course, they got to make it more exciting with the whole water flooding the ship and Kirk swimming and uh, all of these things. Um, and then the whales uh, are free into the ocean and they are uh, and, and they enter the probe. Um, so I read a novel, a Star Trek novel that of course isn't canon, um, after this movie that was like a follow up with this whale probe thing. And I don't really remember anything about what happens in this book, except for, I remember that they had the probe's point of view and the probe was like, uh, 
these creatures that, that I communicated with were very primitive. Um, and that, so I always think that, even though that's not at all canon, but I always think that that probe was like, yeah, what's up with these primitive dudes? Like, I don't know what the fuck they're doing, <laughs> but, but it's not canon. Um, anyway, everyone rejoices, yay! And everyone plays in the water, and Scotty dives in, and it's a lot of fun. Um, and then we go to the final scene with the Federation uh, Council, and at the very beginning, there's a little Easter egg. We've got an Andorian standing next to a cat, Catian, I think they're called, or Cassian, I don't know. The cat people from fucking the animated series. We actually had a live ver live action version of one of those. I didn't know that. We, <laughs> there's a live action version of one of those cat people for just a split second. Like, as soon as they cut over to the, um, the uh, Federation meeting or whatever it's an andorian talking to one of them and i looked it up and it actually is one of them in canon so uh <laughs> pretty cool um so uh spock of course uh stands with his shipmates uh which is very noble and then um kirk gets away with uh his punishment being getting the thing that he's wanted for all four movies, which is being a captain of his own starship. Um, but you know what? He saved a fucking planet, so he deserves it. Uh, if anyone complains that, oh, well, Kirk didn't get any punishment, well, he saved the fucking planet. So he that's what he that's what he should get. Um, Gillian goes to a science vessel. I thought she's going to be studying whales. Uh, uh, how's she going off to a uh, science vessel? Um, and uh, I do hope they check to make sure they didn't wipe out a whole bloodline. I really hope they checked on that because they could always slingshot her back, you know, if they needed to. Um, and we get a very uh, emotional, as far as Vulcans can be emotional, scene between <laughs> uh, Spock and Sarek. I mean, that's about as emotional as it gets. Uh, then at the very end, now they go up uh, to their new assignment uh, and... Sulu was like, I'm counting on the Excelsior. And Scotty's like, oh, why would you want to go on that fucking about? They don't tell him what their assignment is before they get to space dock. Come on. <laughs> Come on. They know. Uh, and then uh, this is where we get the introduction to the Enterprise A. Um, and then uh, at the very, very end, we have Kirk saying, Sulu, let's see what she's got. A scene that is completely, completely undercut in Star Trek V. Uh, honestly, at the time, I thought this was it. This was the end of the films. And even though Star Trek VI ends up being a really quality film, if they had stopped here, uh, I think it would have been a good place to end uh, the films. Uh, but, you know, got to have the cash money. <laughs> so they had to make uh, more films. All right, so there is my recap. Told you this was going to be long. Uh, let me go ahead and give you a, my rating. Uh, so a, my rating out of 10 for Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, with 1 being the lowest possible score, 10 being the highest possible score, is a 9. Um, not quite the 10 that Star Trek II was, but I highly, highly enjoyed this rewatch. I know I nitpick a lot, but that's just fun for me to, 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 to nitpick these things. Uh, the comedy is still on point. The comedic timing is brilliant. The interplay between all the characters is brilliant and still to this day the best Star Trek time travel story in my opinion. Uh, so absolutely golden. Uh, not quite a 10, but it is a 9 out of 10. So thank you so much for joining me for my review for Star Trek 4. Please join me next month when I address the question the philosophers have been asking for centuries. What does God need with a starship? What does God need with a starship? Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, coming next month. I will be reviewing that film. In the meantime, I will be reviewing... Star Trek Picard Weekly and Star Trek Strange New Worlds once that premieres in May. And before that, I will actually be doing a preview live chat discussion, possibly with my brother Mark from Enchantment of Eternity on April 30th. So please subscribe, subscribe, subscribe for all of that content. 
and hit that like button and I will see you soon. Goodbye.